This is David Wilcox. You're listening to The Soul of Life. Where this works is literally in making connections in the brain. It's the only thing that's approved by the FDA to treat suicidal ideation. Today on The Soul of Life, I speak with Dr. Patrick Oliver, an emergency room physician that left the ER to start his own ketamine infusion clinics because he saw a need that no one else was filling to offer life-saving treatment to people suffering from severe depression. I didn't believe him. I was like, there's no way it works this well. He's like, no, it does. I flew out, I talked to his patients, and I'm like, holy shit, this is just, I, I mean, it works like nothing else you've ever seen. In six infusions, somebody 20, 30, 40 years down, somebody suicidal with a plan and a time and a date, and they're just better. We talk about how ketamine works in the brain. It's not a hallucinogen, but it does alter people's perception. Dr. Oliver says the goal of ketamine infusion is partial disassociation, a separation of your sensory experiences from your mind's supervision of them. The alcohol equivalent would probably be buzzed or tipsy. Oliver strongly believes that psychiatry's current standard of care, offering things like Wellbutrin or Zoloft or Paxil, the so-called first-line antidepressants to patients with acute suicidality is dead wrong. After I saw it, I could not do it. Nobody was helping these patients. We discuss misconceptions some people have about what depression really is. Some people think that depression is sadness, and it, unfortunately it is not. It's not a situational sadness. It's a delta between where you should objectively be feeling and where you do feel you are. Dr. Oliver is expecting to publish his first set of data from the treatment at his clinics since they opened in 2017. And he discusses the safety of ketamine even in treating severe depression that's co-occurring with substance abuse. The suicidal ideation just seems to go away. The depression seems to go away. Welcome to the soul of life. I'm Keith Miller. This is episode 13 of season three, using ketamine to treat depression. It's really gonna be a very impressive evolution in psychiatry and psychiatric treatment and save tens of thousands of lives. I'm Keith Miller, and my podcast, The Soul of Life, is here to help you remember who you really are. I'll bring together people who have gotten off their treadmills. I'll have conversations with athletes, musicians, doctors, scientists, healers, and entrepreneurs to discuss the fascinating edges of our knowledge in neurobiology, psychology, and physics. This is The Soul of Life. Have you ever been in a position where you know that you or your family member really needs emotional support or marriage enrichment, but you find out how expensive it is to get access to high quality out of network professionals? Well, I've created the Soul of Life community just for this. At community.souloflifeshow.com, you can join for free and be part of a network of caring and supportive people having conversations that can bring healing to your soul. It's there that you'll find access to psychoeducational courses to deal with stress, anxiety, and relationship conflict. For example, right now I'm offering a seven-week immersive course for couples called Mindful Marriage that walks people through a mindfulness-based stress reduction curriculum I designed that really gives couples in conflict a map towards stability, trust, and deeper intimacy. Just go to community.souloflifeshow.com, check out the courses, and join for free to be part of the Soul of Life community of learners and soul seekers. Dr. Patrick Oliver is an experienced ketamine infusion specialist serving patients at Mind Peace Clinics in Richmond, Arlington, and Norfolk, Virginia. Dr. Oliver started his career as a business process consultant, later realizing his true passion was becoming a physician. He earned his medical degree from the Medical College of Virginia at the Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia, shout out to my own alma mater, and completed his residency in emergency medicine at St. Luke's Hospital in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. He is certified by the American Board of Emergency Medicine and is licensed to practice in Virginia. Dr. Oliver worked for several emergency departments throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia, and he currently teaches medical students and emergency medicine residents in addition to serving as medical director for Mind Peace Clinics. Dr. Oliver, welcome to The Soul of Life. How are you today? Uh, very well. I'm very happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great to see you. We spoke a couple years ago, back when I think Spravada 
which is the nasal uh, S-ketamine, nasal spray ketamine, was just coming out. And I was working with a physician in my clinic, and we were thinking about, you know, is this something we can offer our, you know, our patients? And um, so, you know, you and I, you were very nice enough to speak to me about how you run your clinics. And I was very impressed with um, not just the the amount of information that you know about this subject, but you know the the way that you the care that you give to your patients. So I'm really happy to talk to you today about ketamine and what the what you're doing at, at your clinics at MindPeace, but also just kind of what's what's out there for people, so people can understand how this works. Absolutely, absolutely. So yeah, maybe you can start us off by by talking generally about you know what is ketamine infusion infusion and and how it works. What is it used for? Yeah, so ketamine is a dissociative anesthetic. Um, so at, at high dosages, dosages, it's used both in children and adults to put people to sleep. Um, we found subsequently that at low dosages, and we're saying like 0.1 to 0.3 milligrams per kilogram, um, it kind of helped to relieve pain. Um, and about 21 years ago, at a small school called Yale in Connecticut, um, they created the first or published the first study in 2000, um, basically proof of concept showing that the um, ketamine worked uh, for treating and relieving the symptoms of patients who had treatment-resistant depression previously. Um, and subsequently, there's been approximately 300 studies that are either in process um, or published um, as well as an American Psychiatric Association consensus statement in 2017, um, basically stating that A, this works, and, and B, it should be tried for patients. Yeah. Well, unlike other drugs, let's say, I was going to say street drug drugs because ketamine is also a street drug, but it's used widely in medicine. Uh, other psychedelics um, are still Schedule One. That's changing. We'll talk a little bit today about the difference between ketamine and things like psilocybin and MDMA. But um, ketamine is a schedule three drug, meaning meaning what exactly? Um, it means it's controlled, as in it, it has um, some heightened oversight from the um, FDA. I think it was the late 90s that it was categorized as category three, 98, 99, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason is, is because it is a drug of abuse um, and it has been abused um, over the world. But um, as you mentioned, it's primarily used um, for medicinal purposes, um, overwhelmingly and regularly, both in emergency departments as well as operating rooms throughout the United States. Probably almost everyone listening to this has has used ketamine. Would you agree if they've had a, a dental procedure and gone under, or is it is it more for general anesthesia that type of thing? It, it's normally for general anesthesia. Um, and so, if if you were in the emergency department and broke your arm or had a shoulder dislocation, they could use ketamine too put you to sleep for, you know, 20, 30 minutes, um, and then, you know, take care of whatever issue needed to be taken care of, um, intubated, what have you. And then, um, you could kind of basically wake up, um, within an hour. Right. Right. I want to read a, a, a little statement from, from some, something that you may be familiar with. It's, it's a, it's a book that came out by Paul Wolfson and Glenn Hartelius. Uh, if I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, but and they, their book is called The Ketamine Papers, and it's put out by the by MAPS, Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, because it describes he, this, in this in this section he describes how ketamine works, and I want to ask you about your understanding of how ketamine works in the brain, and sure. talk about what what effect this actually has on people who have a experience of treatment resistant depression, as you mentioned. Wolf, Wolfson describes in the Ketamine Papers. He says, a ketamine psychedelic experience tends to offer up the possibility for transformation of the self by isolating the mind to some extent from external sensations, altering body consciousness towards an experience of being energy without form, and by amplifying the contents of the mind in unpredictable ways, all of this generating the potential for changes in consciousness that may be beneficial and persistent. Um, was that consistent with your understanding of of how your of how ketamine is experienced by people in your clinics? You know, it it it's not a hallucinogen, but it but it does alter people's perception and um you know experience for their sensations, both sight, hearing, etc. Um 
there's kind of essentially two two different theories, and it seems like they're more along the first one being what I refer to as super tentorial, meaning you know a conscious experiential um, type of situation that or, or uh, condition that makes somebody better. Um, my understanding is a little bit more scientific, um, and what I'll say is under the hood, infratentorial, meaning right. th- where this works is um, literally in making connections in the brain. So I like to think of it for your hopefully few few older audience members. Um, the way I think about it is it's like starting a, a manual transmission stick shift car. You push in the clutch, you turn the ignition key, and the engine starts. Um, this medication works in, in a similar way. Um, you push in the clutch, it blocks an NMDA receptor. Um, you turn the key, it activates two other receptors called um, tyrosine kinase B, as well as AMPA. Um, and that effectively turns on the inner workings of the cell, creates growth proteins that, it, that literally instruct the cell to regrow thousands of connections amongst the different neurons. And every neuron could have up to a thousand connections initially. What that does is it increases the glutamate level and decreases the GABA level. And once those are balanced, um, then people's mood disorders seem to get precipitously better. Suicidal ideation decreases and they seem to be more balanced. So if, if today should be a seven and they feel like it's a three and there's always a gap, because some people think that you know, depression is sadness. And and unfortunately it is not, it's not a situational sadness. It's a Delta between where you should objectively be feeling and where you do feel you are. So if you're at a three, it will just make it a seven. It's not going to make a seven to nine. It's not going to give you an artificial high um, or anything like that. um, Long-term, it's just going to basically restore the balance to the GABA and the glutamate. Um, and then downstream effects, dopamine, serotonin, et cetera, but seems to have a much, uh, a much more rapid effect than um, other antidepressant medications because it works on a different neurotransmitter. So it's a different, it's a different key for the lock, if you will. And right. for 72% of patients, it's the right key. That's really fascinating. I want to, I want to break down what you said, because you, there, you, you, you said a lot there, but sort of break down a little bit and translate a little bit. I think that I think you're saying, tell me if this is a, a good understanding of what you just described in the brain, is that it's it's turning on neuroplasticity. Exactly um, right. 100%. right. Which is mental flexibility, emotional range, full range of emotions, and which of course includes sensory experience, which emotions are part of. Um, so it's really boosting that neuroplasticity, which in a depression is is almost shut down or stopped for somebody physically. Exactly right. Exactly right. The neuroplasticity leads to everything that you're talking about, and it, it, it just gives the, the brain the connections to, to be able to do those things that it needs to do. It's really right. Right. fascinating. It's not, not making the brain do something it doesn't already know how to do. It's just, it's just sort of stopping whatever is inhibiting. It's disinhibiting. Exactly right. Exactly right. And, and you know, when I'm explaining it to patients who might not be as you know, medicinally inclined or knowledgeable i explain it like you know branches of a tree every spring there's new branches and the, and the everything is growing and, and sometimes whether it be genetic or ptsd sort of experience um this ends up um literally just regrowing branches so that the the, the nerve cells the neurons and the brain can communicate amongst each other right right and you've seen uh, oh i want to ask you if you've seen this i've heard reports that people in your position at, at ketamine clinic, see somebody come in with chronic suicidality, persistent, um, acute, meaning that they're in a in a state at you know that 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 very day that they're getting the treatment, they 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 have a a, a propensity to want to end their life. They within an hour that's relieved. Is that is that an unusual experience or is that some some sometimes typical? No, I, I mean, we are about to publish our data, which is a fact that you and I haven't really talked about yet, but um, we are showing at six infusions and it can happen within within hours or, or, or even minutes. Mm-hmm. I mean, it really is impressive. And the data has borne this out um, in, in multiple different studies, including Columbia Presbyterian has a, a very good study on, on how rapidly that this absolutely can occur. 
Um, our study is going to show that at six infusions, we have a 50% reduction in suicidal ideation. At uh, 10 infusions, it's 75%. And in 15 infusions, it's 85%. And that should be published hopefully this fall. So, And it's the only thing. I mean, I wish there were something else. It's the only thing that's working to decrease suicidal ideation. That's A, FDA approved with the esketamine nasal spray. And our data shows that the, the racemic ketamine works even better um, than the esketamine does. And that's the infusion, the... The infusion, yep. Yeah. The I, yeah. IV infusion is primarily how it's done. So, some other individuals do do it. I am like an intramuscular shot. Mm -hmm. um, the data isn't quite as robust for that. So the gold standard that we are doing presently is through an IV. Okay. I want to get back to you know, this question that's coming up in, in, in our talking here about you know how long the symptom remittance lasts. Um, but but let's let's talk a little bit about. Can you just walk people through? You know, start to finish, somebody is interested in this and they reach out to your clinic or a clinic like yours. What's the process? Please take the time now to subscribe to The Soul of Life wherever you're listening. Give it a thumbs up or write a positive review. Sure. So the process, they, they contact our clinic, Mind Peace Clinics, um, and they basically get scheduled for an initial consultation. They meet with a physician, either an anesthesiologist uh, or an emergency medicine uh, board certified physician. And we have an hour long conversation with the patient. We go over their medical history. We go over the psychiatric history. Um, we get their story. Basically, we tell them about the risks and the benefits of ketamine, the um, alternatives, um, including ECT and TMS um, and electroshock therapy and electro electro sorry, electroconvulsive therapy and um, repeating transcranial magnetic stimulation. Um, which are two other options uh, for patients who are treatment-resistant depression um, and or suicide. Um, and then we take the next step of getting um, lab work done, listening to the patient, looking at the patient. Um, it is an anesthetic, so we do um, an exam that's consistent with a um, pre-anesthetic um, examination, looking in the back of the throat, making sure everything's okay, um, listening to the heart, the lungs, uh, et cetera. Um, and then we... Um, often go to their mental health provider um, and psychiatrist or psychologist or even licensed professional counselors or social workers um, get the diagnoses, um, try to con uh, coordinate care um, with those individuals. And then um, once we review their labs, um, they come in for an infusion. Um, the infusion uh, time is about 90 minutes. It's about 15 minutes to set up to do some uh, basic validated scales just so we can track their progress, um, like the PHQ-9, the patient health questionnaire, nine question version, um, the GAD-7, um, which is uh, generalized anxiety disorder, seven questions to assess that. Mm -hmm. um, and then we, uh, we drop the medication and we're trying to titrate to partial disassociation. So the first infusion, we started 0.5 milligrams per kilogram. To use an alcohol analogy, where it's the two drink level, mm -hmm. um, and then we try to get them partially disassociated. The alcohol equivalent would probably be buzzed or tipsy, um, and think of them as being somnolent. Um, you know, if somebody asked you a question first thing in the morning and you heard the question and it took a couple seconds to respond, mm -hmm. but you could respond adequately, so you know who you are, you know where you are, but there's just a little delay in that responsiveness. Um, that that's where it seems like we have the best, the most efficacious use and probably secondary to um, saturating a, a certain number of receptors so that we get the response that we want and need. Mm -hmm. um, so, you're, so you're getting real-time feedback from the patient, verbal, exactly. nonverbal. Exactly. They're not put to sleep. We're trying to get them in that mid-range. Mm -hmm. um, and once you get them in that mid-range, uh, the results seem to be um, higher than any other point. Because um, if you go too high, everything will just shut down and you won't get the results that you want. It's mm -hmm. not like you, you want just the brain it. active. Exactly right. Exactly right. So we want just a certain amount of saturation. Um, and then once we get that saturation, it's a 40 minute infusion time um, from start on an infusion pump, which is a very measured um, as closely as we can do to administer the medication. Um, at the end of 40 minutes, um, the line is flush so that we ensure the patient gets all the medication. Um, and once the patient gets all the medication, 
then we take the um, the next step. So just letting them recover in a very quiet and peaceful room. Um, and, you know, the recovery takes 20, 25 minutes for most of our patients. So they're, they're under, so to speak, or, or, or in the trance, so to speak, for 15 minutes or up to an hour? Um, yeah, probably close to an hour. Um, with the 20-minute recovery time, it takes <laughs> probably five to 10 minutes for them to start feeling the effects of the medication. And then the medication lasts about 20 minutes where they're still um, a little bit out of it and not really able to walk or anything like that, just like any right. anesthetic would be. Right, right. Um, in my conversations with some other folks, like notably um, Dr. Michael Mithofer, who's the lead investigator on the MDMA, uh, FDA's approval of the, of MDMA for studies, which is a you know ha- has been a groundbreaking achievement in and of itself, as some people would know. Um, the FDA, you know, because of the cultural kind of culture war against drugs in the '60s and '70s, banned even researchers from getting their hands on any any of these substances because they were so thought of as so dangerous and so risky that we basically still <laughs> are in the dark ages scientifically about how they actually work. We're just starting to get some data now. And Michael Midhofer um, was one of those people getting the FDA on board and, and still publishing those, um, those papers. He, he goes through a great deal when, when people are using MDMA, for example, and I believe psilocybin is the same. Um, you know, they, there's a lot of discussion about set and setting, you know, this idea of, you know, if you're passed out in your friend's bathroom and all alone on a dark and rainy night and you're, high on special K, um, you, you're, you may have what we'd call a bad trip uh, versus <laughs> if, you're, if you're with someone who is speaking with you and, and is a caretaker and has spent time to get to know you, is empathetic and is holding your hand perhaps even, you know, some appropriate physical touch and is nearby and you're supported, that tends to have a good effect with the, the sort of psychedelic treatments. Do you do you agree that that's important or is that less important with ketamine? It seems less important. You know, I, I mean, there's two schools of thought. There, there's the school of thought that basically the setting matters and um, how you feel matters and the experiential element is very important. Um, you know, obviously it, it does play some sort of a, um, a role in that. Um, that being said, um, you know, from my standpoint, it's just the neurobiochemical response. You're either making these connections or you're not. You either like the, if you like the experience and or don't like the experience, uh, kind of like a roller coaster. Some, pa- some of my patients really enjoy the ketamine experience. Um, other patients do not like it at all. And it doesn't seem to affect if it works, if it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. And I think it, I, I think it really goes back to the neurobiochemical you know, creation of, of these connections and the balancing of the, of the GABA and glutamate um, neurotransmitters. That being said, the one carve out exception that I have noticed that um, seems to really play a role is patients with PTSD. If there's one specific situation or, or series of situations that the patient struggles with very intently on a, on a very conscious level, sometimes those types of uh, experiences cause a patient to react and not necessarily have that experience, whether it be a sexual assault or a military issue from um, our troops in Afghanistan and Iraq, a car accident, et cetera. Um, It seems to encapsulate it, put it in a little bit better perspective. And to that extent, those patients seems to do a little bit better with the the talk therapy and with the ketamine giving them the the disassociation um, needed to adequately um, consciously deal with those feelings, et cetera. Right. Um, but it seems to be irrespective of, you know, I know counseling and this and that. I, I mean, I think that those things are very important and valuable for 80% of individuals dealing with issues, but the issues that we're dealing with, especially the suicidality, um, as long as it's not situationally based, as in I broke up with my girlfriend and I want to kill myself like a reaction, it, it really seems to be um, at, a, at a different level. I mean, we just make the neural connections and it either works or it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. And how long does it work for? That's, you're talking about kind of, you need to establish a sort of an acute and <coughs> persistent so this is treatment resistant for people who don't r- recognize that sort of uh, my understanding would be that that, you know, they have tried all of the first line 
antidepressants. Yes. Uh, and ketamine is not considered one of those. It is not. So they've tried probably maybe years worth, or I mean, at what point do you say, okay, this person qualifies versus, you know, maybe this person should try six months with a psychiatrist? Yeah. So that's a great question. So from our perspective, initially, when we based our practice on the uh, National Institutes of Mental Health, Carlos Sorate and his fantastic team of researchers um, in Maryland, um, and they basically said that um, a failure of two outpatient um, trials of antidepressant medication of adequate dosage and duration um, effectively constitutes um, uh, you know, a, a treatment failure or a treatment resistant patient. Right. Um, it, uh, I think it's evolved a little bit, um, both in, in, in our practice at Mind Peace, as well as, um, I think throughout the nation, because the S ketamine, um, nasal spray, this bravado, um, got FDA approval for, um, both treatment resistant depression, major depressive disorder, um, as well as suicidal ideation and gestures. It's the only thing that's um, that's approved by the FDA to treat suicidal ideation. And if somebody comes in suicidal, I, I think a trial of oral antidepressants uh, probably, in my opinion, should not be first line because they're not approved for decreasing suicidality. And I think that the challenge that I have, I mean, we've been doing it for, you know, since 2017. So at this point in time, more than four years worth of time that we've been practicing, um, you know, it, it, it's tough to change the psychiatric and the mental health community's understanding as opposed to just defaulting to oral antidepressants that have been shown, A, either not to work effectively for suicidal ideation, um, or B, there's even some, um, especially with youth and teenagers, an increased risk of suicide in the first couple of weeks for oral antidepressants. I mean, I believe ketamine should be a first line treatment because it's the only thing that's been shown to work. Right, right. And in, in, to your knowledge, is is it Spravato or Spravato? I think it's uh, Spravato. Spravato. With an O at the end. It, it, to, your, to your knowledge, is, is Spravato available typically at emergency rooms? So, to the best of my knowledge, it's not um, available in any or many mm. um, emergency departments. That being said, the uh, the team at Johnson and Johnson that's respect that's responsible for uh, marketing uh, this medication um, just got approval this year, 2021, to um, actually start speaking with emergency physicians, um, and hopefully in the not too distant future, um, either ketamine and or s ketamine um, will be available. At this point in time, ketamine is available. For emergency physicians, it's on the World Health Organization list of essential meds, and is present in every emergency department in the United States. They're just um, not using it for like, suicide. They're just not using it for this indication, and yeah. um, you know that might change in the next three to five years. I would hope. Yeah, I, I I am always hesitant to sort of sound like a a drug representative and say, you know, advocate for drugs. Uh, generally speaking, I think we should be cautious about it and, and try to use a holistic approach, but the results that you're referring to sound life-saving, similar, similar to how Narcan is available now um, and widely in, in ambulances and emergency responders for opioid overdose. It seems like um, this drug, and I, I thought it was, uh, I thought it was Janssen, but it's, you're saying um, it's it's J and J that that makes J Janssen is a subsidiary of Johnson and Johnson, so oh, it is so Janssen it is. Pharmaceuticals. Okay. Most Got patients it. are or you know, individuals are just more familiar with the Johnson and Johnson brand. Makes sense. That makes sense. Um, so back to, you know, and these are technical questions. I want to sort of get through this uh, a little bit and then talk a little personally about your, your, your career and why you got into this field and, and what you're getting out of it too, right? Working with working and seeing these results with people. Um, how long does it last? Is there, is there, and is there any risk of boomerang? Like depression gets worse? Like yeah. alcohol is, is known, like people people uh, for m millennia probably have turned to alcohol to self medicate depression, and um, we know that that makes depression worse. Yeah, and alcohol is a depressant, so obviously that's not a, a, a good option. Um, you know, it, it's interesting. Ketamine obviously has a stigma about it because of its um, 
history of, of being used and or abused by individuals recreationally. Um, and what we have come to find is that, um, you know, we've treated alcoholics and heroin abusers and cocaine users and marijuana and, and you name it. We, we've treated these patients and there doesn't seem to be any addictive potential uh, or, or at least realized addiction elements at the dosages that we're using for treating these patients, um, mm-hmm. which is yeah. which is very helpful, especially, you know, because we're midway through an opioid epidemic. And your clinic at, at Mind Peace Clinics, do you do you do some sort of screening for for people with addiction history, or or, or are you saying really there even if somebody has an addiction history, maybe that makes them even more indicated that this could actually help them with the addiction? Yeah, so there are clinics, um, especially Clarity Clinic in Las Vegas, um, that has been treating addiction for rapid detoxification. Um, alcoholics. Uh, have been treated in hospitals with ketamine for acute Mm. withdrawal syndromes. And there's um, starting to be a growing amount of literature on that topic. Um, We rarely focus on the addiction um, potential because we primarily focus on mood disorders, um, migraine headaches even, um, and chronic pain like your CRPS, your RSD, um, your fibromyalgia type of patients. Um, That being said, like the suicidal ideation just seems to go away the depression seems to go away and people there's about a third of people that need booster infusions on, on a regular basis. Mm-hmm. Um, but our, um, our literature that's about to be published is showing a 38% permission rate. So we're taking people that have been depressed for 20, 30, 40 years. Um, and that depression just goes into remission. Um, I always do kind of think about it like an alcoholic type of thing. You always have the potential for the depression or suicidal ideation to come back, even an alcoholic at, you know, with a 20 year chip of being uh, sober, you know, still would consider themselves an alcoholic. Like this is a, this is a chronic disease um, and we're offering remission, um, but a 38% remission with people that have been treatment resistant and have tried everything else um, really is an amazing number. And um, the percentage of people that respond with a 50% improvement in their mood on validated scales is 72%. So basically three out of four patients that I see are, um, you know, getting better. Right. Right. And just to put in perspective, I had, I interviewed a psychiatrist back in season one, Dr. Joel Bernanke, and he made a really interesting comment about people's skepticism uh, of, of the efficacy, the effectiveness of psychiatric medicines that often they're, they're quite low. When you, when you look at the results of Zoloft, um, for example, the, the effect size is, you know, the effect is very low. Um, and we still prescribe them at, at, a, at a huge rate. And you're, you're citing a number like 38%. Somebody may say, well, 38%, that's kind of low. But actually, you know, there is in, in general medicine, and you would know this more than I would, but he, Dr. Bernanke said, the, made the comment like in cardiology, for example, um, nobody says, you know, if, if the first cholesterol drug doesn't work for you, nobody laughs it off and says, you know, why, why do you go to a cardiologist? Usually you're trying multiple things. Everybody's different. You may try three or four drugs or a combination of drugs for multiple things. And we do that all the time in general medicine. So there's no, there's no drug that's a hundred percent. It's true. And I mean, and keep in mind our patient population that, that <clears throat> excuse me, that, that come to our clinic. I mean, they have tried 10% have tried ECT. Um, you know, there's a certain percentage that have tried TMS. And I mean, these are patients who failed other things, talk therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, multiple rounds of medications, being at benzodiazepines and antidepressants, SSRIs, SNRIs, mood stabilizers. I mean, I am not their first call. I am the fourth quarter, you know, quarterback that you need to make the Hail Mary pass. And we do it yeah. three out of four times. You do it a lot. That's, that's pretty amazing. Um, th- this is a question you don't have to answer if you'd rather not, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about your own history, whether you've ever tried an infusion, um, you know, in a separate question from that, I'll give you a second to think about that if you want to answer that. But, um, th- the separate question is, you know, if somebody wasn't depressed, somebody didn't have a, a persistent depression and they, they got an infusion. Um, I talked to a friend of mine who, who took his dad for, who, you know, who really needed it, had treatment resistant depression, took his dad to a clinic in, in Bethesda. And his impression of it was, you know, if you're showing up with a payment with a credit card, you can sort of get the infusion that you choose. 
Um, and there are, as you would probably know as well, that there, there are clinics out there like that. Um, so, you know, if somebody, if somebody did that, I mean, we're not recommending that, but is, is there, is there the same effect to, you know, for example, I'm even wondering, it, would the research eventually one day say, well, wait a minute, what about, um, cognitive decline, normal cognitive decline? What, why not using, ket, use ketamine before depression, um, for normal, maybe age related or performance issues? Is there, an effect for that? Is there a demand for that? Well, I mean, let's start with the first one. Uh, I have not used ketamine uh, recreationally and or having it um, given to me by a physician. It's just not my thing. I'm also the type of guy that hasn't smoked a cigarette. Um, that being said, you know, I have a nice little bourbon collection. So I guess I guess I just choose my vices a little bit differently. <laughs> um, and I... Uh, you know, when you look, could it enhance performance? It's possible. I haven't seen any data on it or, um, you know, but I I have had one patient and he did the Lumosity, you know, neuro challenging questions and so on and so forth. And he said his, his numbers went from like, you know, 900 to 1200. And I know it is, you know, after doing it for several years and doing six or eight infusions with us, I mean, when you're talking neuroplasticity and and the c- capacity and capabilities of the mind, I mean, to say that we are only scratching the surface with this is, I think, very accurate. Um, you know, it, it, it's a medication that's controlled, and I think it should be controlled appropriately, and it can alter somebody's mind and somebody's perceptions, and you know, driving you know, after doing ketamine, you know, for the first, you know, 12 hours or so, um, maybe even up to 24 hours, we instruct our patients not to drive or operate any heavy machinery. I mean, it's an, it's a mind altering medication. And when you're dealing with that, and I think it should be done appropriately in a physician's office with a physician present to the same standard that's done in the hospital. That being said, I mean, you definitely brought up a challenge in the community that does this, um, you know, and the American Society of Ketamine Physicians has, is starting to address it, um, being like, there's a whole bunch of different people doing this, and they're doing it to a whole bunch of different standards. And at MindPeace, I, I like to believe it and really truthfully know that we are doing it to one of the highest standards that's done in the nation. Um, that being said, you know, there's, um, you know, CRNAs um, that are doing this and opening up clinics throughout the nation, um, and they have no psychiatric training at all. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's individuals, you know, it is a fee for service type of thing. And, you know, like, like any um, conditions, um, you know, when you're when you're giving money for a service, you know, there's, there's some, you know, incentive for um, an individual to to give the patient what they would like. Um, you know, I've been around long enough to understand that that's often uh, not in the best interest of the patient. You know, giving an antibiotic for a virus is not helpful for a patient, even though it might make them feel better. It, it doesn't fix the problem and could potentially cause other problems. So I, I think that as a physician, you need to be an individual um, strong enough to be like, listen, I don't think this is in your best interest. And both you and I need to agree that this is the right thing for you to do. We have had patients, you know, we have been approached by even a physician saying, hey, she wanted to experience this and ayahuasca and everything. And we politely decline to honor her request. And, you know, some patients just truthfully aren't, aren't sick enough for this medication um, or haven't tried other options. That being said, like, you know, it doesn't seem that there's there's been any harm from patients who are not responsive um, to our medication. It does not seem to worsen their depression. It just, mm-hmm. uh, it does not seem to exacerbate their suicidal ideation and or anxiety. And, and are people sometimes, um, in re- you, that 38% number that you mentioned, is that in remission at, um, without any further doses or are they still without any, without, without any further dosage? So that's the best outcome, right? The, no, no further doses yeah. needed. Yeah. I mean, 38%. So, I mean, almost four out of 10 wow. patients, are, are having prolonged remission. Wow. I mean, they're just better. Wow. Like it just, that, that is, it just yeah. fixes them. Yeah. That, that's amazing. I, I interviewed 
Bessel van der Kolk, um, who many people would know as right now, I think it's the number one best-selling book in nonfiction on New York Times, at least. Um, the body keeps the score, and he he's publishing what he thinks is maybe his last paper, but he thinks it's his best paper. In his words, and it's on MDMA and, and the re, uh, research there with the P- PTSD and MDMA treatment, um, otherwise otherwise known as ecstasy. And th- his his words were, "Holy shit!" Like yeah. th- that's how he summarized the study: is "Holy shit!" And it's like yeah. the results, and it's you know. Like you said, I mean, we have to emphasize that is uh, it, it, holistic care is really the gold standard, and this is a lifetime journey of things. It's not a one shot thing, and definitely not trying this at home or with your local neighborhood drug dealer. This is sure. this is you know something you don't do yourself. But you know his his words were profound. Holy shit! Like this stuff is we're really onto something, and hopefully this continues to the body of knowledge continues to grow. Yeah, and, and I, th- I think it's important to to t- talk about the psychedelics, and at least the preliminary research has been very positive. Um, you know, the benefit of ketamine is that we have 21 years worth of experience for mental health and studies, and it's a 50 year old med, so it's it's a little bit, you know, more studied and published on and understood by the medical community. That being said, I, I think it's going to be fascinating to learn. Um, the neurobiochemical pathways by which the ayahuasca, the NDMA, the psilocybin work, if it's the same, if they're having, you know, better results than ketamine, um, you know, but it's definitely going to be an evolution in the next two to five years where we're going to have hopefully a pretty significant greater understanding about how these, you know, medications and substances work to, you know, affect the brain um, and the mind specifically. And it's it's really going to be, I, I think, um, a very impressive evolution in psychiatry and psychiatric treatment, and you know, hopefully, theoretically, save you know uh, tens of thousands of lives. I mean, we're talking a suicide rate right now of plus or minus fifty thousand a year, it's and seventeen point seven, seventeen point eight vets a day. So, I yeah. mean, we're talking about bringing that down to like seven thousand five hundred. And two to three vet deaths a day. I mean, veteran, United States veterans. I mean, these numbers, even with the ketamine, before we get into the psychedelics, I mean, can have, you know, an impressive change in, in how patients are treated and how efficaciously we deliver this treatment to them. Thank you, Dr. Patrick Oliver, for being here today with me on The Soul of Life. Is there any anything you want to share with people? Where can people find you and, and uh, find out more about what you offer? Sure. Um, two things. One, I wanted to address one question that we didn't get to. Yeah. Um, and that's why I got into this. And yes. the, 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 the real simple version is five, six years ago, there was a patient that came in the uh, mid thirties individual into a, an emergency department in Southside regional in Petersburg, Virginia. Um, and she'd literally been suffering with depression for years. Um, and on a beautiful crisp fall morning, she went out into her shed and shot herself in the head. Mm-hmm. And I tried to convert her husband from, um, you know, from understanding she's dead and possibly donating her organ organs before he realized how his whole world just shattered leaving two children behind that are approximately eight and 10 years old. And unfortunately I couldn't do it. And I was like, if there's anything that I can do um, going forward to make somebody, you know, to, to fix this basically, then I'm going to do it. And spoke with um, a, a buddy from college's brother who was doing this out in Seattle. And he said, I said, how did you get into this? He's like, some guy called me up and said, Hey, will you give me a ketamine infusion? And I said, no. I was like, well, then how did you get into it? He's like, wait, wait, wait. I was in a study at the National Institutes of Mental Health. I was depressed for 20 years. So this is the only thing that's worked. I mean, he told me how well it worked. And like, just like you were saying, this guy, you know, it's, you know, I was like, I didn't believe him. I was like, there's no way it works as well. He's like, no, it does. I flew out. I talked to his patients. And I'm like, holy shit. I'm like, this is, I mean, really, this is just, I, I mean, it works like nothing else you've ever seen. In six infusions, somebody 20, 30, 40 years down, somebody suicidal with a plan and a time and a date. 
and they're just better. And now, now they're working, now they're doing this. I mean, it's, yeah. it's how do we impact people's lives? If people are either in this spot or know somebody who might be in this spot um, in the Commonwealth of Virginia, and we're actually coming to San Francisco in the next couple of months, um, patients are, are willing to reach out to us. It's mindpeaceclinics.com. Um, and we're more than happy to take it from there. And they can start doing their own research um, a little bit on the web um, and, and getting kind of the feel for this. And there's an American Psychiatric Association consensus statement saying to do it. I mean, there's and a growing body of knowledge, but we're happy to talk to any patient um, who might be considering this. And especially if they're suicidal, um, we should hopefully be one of their first calls. I really appreciate that. And and yeah, I, I'm glad you took the time to, to answer that question because it's it's something, it's remarkable because obviously you had a successful career in medicine prior to this. And that represents, that sounds like a, that that's a, a major turnaround for you to change, change direction. I, I just, I couldn't not, after I saw it, I could not do it. Nobody yeah. was helping these patients. And I was like, I, I, I mean, you go into medicine to do no harm, but like, yeah not doing this would have been harm. And so yeah. it, it, there's more than a few errors in the back and, you know, wounds as, as you know, that the, the medicine community doesn't necessarily like change very much. Right. Um, and they're a little adverse to it. I mean, everything from hand washing to, to realizing that H pylori was causing, you know, um, issues in, in people's stomachs. Right. But the simple version is we persist and we publish literature and, we evolve and we care for the patients better subsequently. And follow I, the I data. That's, yeah, just and and once you follow it, you're just going to see the results. Very cool, very cool. Well, I hope we get a chance to talk more and 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 speak and and definitely we'll put information about Mind Peace Clinics on the Soul of Life website at soulofleifeshow.com. Thank you, Doctor Oliver. Hey, thank you so much for the opportunity, and um, I look forward to um, working together with you in the future. Hey, I've started a community for Soul of Life fans interested in talking about episodes or getting more information about some of my teaching on IFS, mindfulness, and relationship growth. Head on over to community.souloflifeshow to get access to this group of really cool people just like you who care about the show and want to talk about episodes or, or hear more, or get access to courses and, and support each other through life. That's what this is all about. Please leave an iTunes rating for the show and subscribe now wherever you listen to get more soul in your life. I like it and it's not harsh to my eardrum. All right, I will go.